you'll like your action figure films all cartooned up with overblown action scenes, gravity-free CGI effects, time filler flashbacks, and actor Joseph Gordon-Levitt showing up as a steampunk Darth Vader in a bad Halloween store wig? We've got all that and much, much more with G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra. And before we flush it, we're going to take it on play with it a little. Go restroom! We're here to flush it, so you don't have to see it. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. I am Honor Knight, your head cinematic flusher right here in the restroom. As always, I'm joined by my lovely co-cinematic flushers, Midwest movie mogul, Colleen Griffin. Hey, hey, hey. And raging Buddha B-movie queen, Norcrest. What's up? Also joining us as part of our extended co-flushing team this time out is content creator, Sarah Polton. Hey. And the action figure half of the Blockbusters podcast, Paul G.I. Hawk Hawkins. I told you to lose this number, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you think you're out, Paul, we just keep pulling you pulling back. You back. <laughs> Every time Raging Buddha Beam Movie Queen Norcrest spends some time in our stall and reads the writing on the restroom wall, she's never quite the same. Let's see who turns up in this week's Raging Buddha Stats. This is Destro of Clan McCullen, and these are the stats for G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra. This movie starts out in the 1600s. Why? Because my fucking backstory matters to the entire plot of the film and future look of my face. I make weapons, as my family has since, well, at least the 1600s. I've designed nanobots that will eat anything I tell them to and not stop until I say so. The ultimate weapon. I get to say a huge fuck you to Duke by shoving my tongue down Baroness's throat right in front of him. The G.I. Joes were, of course, no match for me until the very end when, of course, I am captured. But it's not over. Cobra! Film should have been called either Upper G.I. Joe, The Rise of Colitis, or <laughs> Knowing is Half the Dookie. All right, I got lazy on that second one. Okay, I said <laughs> G.I. Joe, putting the bro in Hasbro. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Uh, G.I. Joseph Gordon Lovett. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, that's a cheap one, but we're going we're gonna to let you slide, Polton, this time. I, I'm always a cheap one. Show, Paul? G.I. Wonder Whose Dick Got Sucked to Make This Film. Oh, oh, whipping out the dick way early in the running time. Coming folks. out saucy and sassy and hot. I said you were better off uh, playing with yourself than with these lame action figures. <laughs> $175 million budget, guys, must have went to the actors and craft services because it sure as hell didn't go to the VFX department. It looked like Sharknado-style graphics. Yeah. <laughs> it so did. I'm sorry. I think a lot of the budget went to neoprene jumpsuits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said if I didn't have ADHD before I saw this film, I sure do now. Oh, I had to take breaks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have to take breaks. Oh, no, I think the breaks. director did with four the way breaks. he interspersed yeah. the flashbacks. And two of those were pee breaks, right, Polton? I literally just stopped watching this movie so I could <laughs> clean my apartment because that seemed like more fun. <laughs> I, actually, I actually did take a pee break and it was just like, eh. Uh, it was great for like 30 minutes. And I was like, I could stop watching this. Um, and the final note on this was the, I said the entire film plays like Team America, but uh, with the live actors. <laughs> Yeah. But not funny. I think I think this director was like obsessed. No, it's funny. With making a live action version of the cartoon. I guess he was. But no, he, because the even point? the cadence. I feel like. Ugh. Okay, again, after watching Van Helsing with something with the same director, I don't blame the actors. I feel like he then told. If them, he was gonna do no, an homage to the cartoon, he should have done the end scene and done like a little PSA no, during the no, credits. No, yeah. no. that would have been great. Come on. That would have been don't great. Don't make movies like mine, kids. <laughs> France, sixteen forty-one. Uh, who knew the GI Joe franchise was this old? Well, I was just going to say, isn't it brilliant that the opening of the all-American hero film is in royalist France? <laughs> <laughs> I spent the entire film trying to understand the first scene. I don't understand it at all. Oh, you still don't get I, it. Okay. It's like Saw meets Man in the Iron Mask. 
The uh, and that line was, and then there's a line during the sequence, which folks, it opens in France, and, and they're they're about to execute a guy who was who was selling arms to another country and his own country, but then it ties into the stuff later on. And he says, my he, well, they have him chained up, and they're about to put this really hot mask on him. Uh, and he says, my sons will continue to rise long after I'm gone. The only thing that's going to rise is my level of laughter over how bad everyone's glued on facial hair is in this opening scene. Nobody had a real beard. For, yeah, for so a minute, I thought it was James McAvoy, and then, <laughs> and then I, after looking it up, it turns out it's a guy called David Murray, who's number <laughs> number one known for role on IMDb is Jumpy Thug in Batman Begins. <laughs> I know so many actors who get gigs because they can grow a big beard. Like, just grow a beard. You're going to get booked. Someone will cast you because apparently there are no men out there with beards for any of these movies. No, there isn't. This, this opening scene really – is it tacked on? Do you think Do you think this was done after, like, all the, the regular production was, then they realized they needed something else? Yeah, I think uh, that, it's like – a little rushed. I think maybe, like – he was, you know, the director was looking at the dailies. He had some coke. He saw Man in the High Cat, or no, 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 uh, the Man in the Iron Mask. Yeah, and it's just like, oh, you know what I need to do. Uh, in the not too distant future, this film's still gonna suck. But, Hundreds of years, but not too distant. Well, I don't understand it. Yeah, the opening is 1641, so really, the not too distant future would have been 1646. My notes say mustache, and then they say way distant future. <laughs> <laughs> Connect those two where you but can. But I believe what they're trying to do is say, obviously, this was the past, and now this is not too distant future from right now. Nanobites, perfect little soldiers. I'm not going to do uh, Mr. Eccleston's accent, but Doctor Who's Christopher Eccleston, one season, mind you, oh, goes boy. up on a three minute mark, on no doubt regretting his decision to leave Doctor Who and fill out the rest of his career playing lame villains in big budget turds like this one. Thor the Dark World? Suck. By the way, 60 seconds. Suck. I would watch the shit out of a G.I. Joe Doctor Who crossover movie. <laughs> Apparently, like, this is why he left Doctor Who. He's, like, very stubborn about keeping his accent out of Scottish pride. But he's lousy. I don't care about the accent. So it, it actually is interesting. No, but I mean, that's but... why he, like, left Doctor Who is because he had a different idea of the character. Oh, man, I should have let him do it. God, I'm tired of seeing him in these roles. I just wrote down, oh, look, it's someone from the UK with lots of money. I wonder if he's a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> so Eccleston plays uh, the modern day version. The guy who got his face burned off, he's a dist he's a relative, a long removed relative of that guy. And he heads up a whole biotech company. He's Destro, folks. If you're following, if you're with the, if you're playing with your action figures, this is the Destro. Spoiler thing. alert. No, he doesn't. <laughs> I know. I hate to kill it early, but he doesn't. He doesn't have the metal head but yet. But he mentions it in yeah. early it's on that. Too. Yeah, there's what Destro. they called his relative. But come on, spoiler alert. I, all right, all right. Watch this test of the first nanomite warhead. I said nanobite in the first one. I think it's nanomite. Uh, who cares? Yeah, yes. it's nanomite because it's like I a. Electronic parasite. Right, so the Nanomite Warhead is basically a green fart cloud uh, that dissolves anything in its path. Uh, I thought it was very scary. That's what I wrote, Three Minute Mark. Actually, it's not, I was being sarcastic. You know what it reminded me of? Remember Rainbow Bright? Um, <laughs> yeah. And Murky and Lurky, when they would have, like, the cloud of sadness. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the Incredible Hulk just farted. That was my... Well, <laughs> same thing. Uh, Fallout Boy... Oh, shit, I, I did Fallout Boy, but that's not the way it goes. Uh, that works, too. Fallout boys. Ah, who cares? Channing Tatum appears on screen as Duke <laughs> around the five minute mark. And as soon as he opens his mouth, he reaches Matt Damon levels of awful with his acting. This is his early days as an actor. He was still coming uh -huh. off his high of being a stripper <laughs> and then branching out <laughs> into acting. So he wasn't quite sure where to look. You see him look directly in the camera like three oh, or four yeah. times. I feel like he was directed to do that. Upon doing just one Google search, he was basically forced into doing this. He didn't want to do it because he felt it glorified war, but he was contractually obligated to do it. Well, he thought it glorified war, not that it made absolutely no sense. <laughs> Right. He didn't want to do it in the first place, and then also it glorified war. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, so this isn't the first time he played a character named Duke, though. I just thought he was reading all of his lines off a cereal well, box. Also, he was coming off of, you know, Step Up to the well, streets. I, but he's, so, you I, know. Hey, I love that movie. I'm not saying he's improved that much. He I think could he's have a dance-off in this movie. Maybe if they had a dance-off scene. <laughs> he was very good in Magic Mike 2. Uh, hey, Bill, uh, put that in the rhino, will you? Marlon Wayans plays the uh, comic relief uh, Joe... Uh, named Ripcord. I'm sorry. And all I wanted to do is rip his vocal box out so he couldn't make any more awful jokes. 
five minute mark. They're two buddies on the same. Uh, they're not part of the Joes yet. They're on a separate. They're just in the army, and they're they're um charged with guarding the the warhead, the Hulk fart cloud nanomite warheads we mentioned earlier. Uh, and now Marlon Wayans is his buddy. He is terrible, guys. I don't know if Marlon Wayans was ever funny. Can anybody confirm this before I really get into this? Or yes, he was funny. Are you joking me? Judging on this film? Come on, I you never watched In Living Color or Scary Movie? I mean, come on. The he's written one, funny yeah. stuff. He's done funny stuff. I'm talking about the original Scary Movie. All right, because yeah. I, I did say he may be Scary Movie funny, but he's definitely not G.I. Joe funny. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> he should have just totally parodied it up and just been like, I'm going to use my strong hand. He should have just blacked it up. Why didn't he black it up a little bit? He was he old. did. He yeah. did for a second. Did. Was, that's, really? Okay, okay. Dora, that's scary movie too. Oh, I know. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> all right. Let's let's get our scary movies correct first of all. Okay. Well, regardless, I thought he could. I don't know what the problem was here. He's maybe he's walking through it too. But he's he's no, not. I mean, none like of this stuff how is. How they were directed. If you watch Van Helsing, you see the same type of like deer and headlights. What the hell do you want me to do? All right. So these two guys. No, one can't act and one's not funny. Uh, that's a bad way to go into this, but all right. I feel like everybody signed up for this movie really enthusiastic. And then once they got there, they were like, oh, this is bad. Roger that. There's nothing up here but us. Uh, and this badly composited CGI aircraft at the seven minute mark. Wow. Uh, it's a night. We're got to go to a night shoot. They're, they're, on, they're escorting the warhead over land. And uh, there's a there's a goofy looking CGI. Uh, Chris, right off the bat, we got bad CGI. Right well, there. yeah, I mean, this was totally Ooh. shot in the San Fernando Valley. Because this <laughs> was really? shot in L.A. I mean, this is shot like right out in Simi Valley. Those rock formations and stuff and that crap ass road that's in Simi Valley. I mean, right, it's just right it's so obviously not Kurdistan. I don't know where they were. They I'm were sorry, like Kurdistani hole. people. Yeah. Uh, we're under attack. They're after the warheads. No shit. Uh, seems like all three script writers just watched every episode of the G.I. Joe cartoon and then lifted the dialogue straight from it. When the first aircraft gets hit and is going down in flames and the guy in the other one just goes, Pioneer One, you've been hit. I think they've <laughs> noticed. <laughs> um, they're dead already. Hello, Duke. Uh, Sienna Miller uh, appears decked out in a black leather spandex and a horrible wig like uh, she's a high-end call girl on her way to meet a client at a costume party. Ten minute mark. Man, her acting is, is nearly as bad as his. I'm sorry, it looks like a fan film of Underworld. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She cannot walk in those heels. But I was genuinely terrified point. that she right? was going to roll her ankle <laughs> any time they do like that long shot. You can see her wobbling in those heels. Like someone, they eventually put her in lower heels, but in those opening scenes, she is in like really five tall. inch heels or something. Right. Cause oh, long taller than that. I'm um, so tired of seeing fun. women who tired has to be in like prostitute heels. Why is she wearing heels? But she's ass. right. She's a soldier or just part of a, a, a command no, thing. It's, it's not bullshit. practical. It's not Have you practical. not seen Jurassic World? You can uh, run it. Well, oh, oh, no, oh, oh, come on. When she turned up, I wrote down. So they send many guys in heavy armor and one woman with cleavage. So yeah. typical JRPG logic then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, and I think no, half the budget cleavage. went to boob cups. On well, both even, her and on Scarlet. Oh, oh, really? Oh, yeah, Rachel Nichols. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about her. Um... Well, she was in cleavage and reading glasses from Walgreens. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. State your name and rank. Uh, Dennis Quaid looks visibly constipated, uh, appearing as a hologram uh, to Tatum around the 13-minute mark. Do you think he was paid in Ducalax? <laughs> oh, I hope so. <laughs> he what? I will talk about him. He's the hologram. He is the head commander, General Hawk. What is he doing here, guy? He spits out he's all doing the same thing he's been doing for the last decade uh, now. Where he just stands no. there with a smoky look on his I face. Know that shit <laughs> right. Cool Hand Luke meets uh, Han Solo. What? <laughs> There's only three movies I like him in, and that's Inner Space, Enemy Mine, and Postcards from the Edge. And, and that's it. Up here, up. Well, no, not that. But I no. Oh, my God, no. no. Personally, I think his best role was in movie 43. Uh, oh, <laughs> hey, uh, okay, uh, Paul, if I'll you want to do a, if you want to do a blockbusters on that, please let me know because oh, no. I'm trying to get them to do it. Yeah, uh, I will say that one of the films you guys forgot, uh, it was in the 80s, I believe. It was a remake. It was called DOA. He was very good in that. If you okay. see, and it was the same directors who did Super Mario Brothers. I can't believe they... Oh, my God. Oh, but that's, the film, that's like a credit? I know, but the DOA yeah. remake was amazing. And then they folded up. But Dennis Quaid hasn't done anything other than shaking his head from side to side <laughs> and making a smarmy face. <laughs> and then going, what? Like, that's it. That's his whole shtick. He okay, looks guys. like my dad in a Halloween costume trying to be in the <laughs> army. He wouldn't okay, be like, oh, I he looks like a military that. guy. 
it's a paycheck movie because like he could have been excited about doing this. I don't understand like, but he doesn't. Maybe look he was nostalgic oh, for his little GI Joe doll. I forgot. I looked this up. He did it. We have his son who was in the Hunger Games to blame for this. Oh, is that who we got this blame? This yes, time? his son told him you have to do a dad because I love GI Joe. Ugh, GI. First of all, I never liked GI Joe growing up. I'm going on record now. I grew up in the '80s with this, like right. What? As, no, I never liked GI. I thought they were gay. What's the I matter with you? Yay, oh. honor. You I thought, honor it was just, without saying something. No, no, no. I just thought it was like it was like a military version of the village people. I never, I never got into them. But oh, the come fun. on. Oh, they were not interesting to me. The I liked, only one that, yeah, that, that belonged that in the good. village people was shipwreck. No, they all were gay in the village people. It's the village people, guys. I'm saying I'm saying in G.I. Joe, the only one we knew that was like a village people escapy was Shipwreck. (laughs) And that's fine. That's Shipwreck. I I thought they were hot, so I was like, yeah. They were not hot. Sarah, really? Yeah, but they hooked up with my Barbie dolls. It was all I just wondered when my waist was gonna become that tiny, like Scarlet and Lady J. Me too. Um, (laughs) doesn't speak. Uh, Snake Eyes looks like a politically correct version of an Abercrombie and Finch mannequin. What the fuck is why does why is his mouth open and the mask? I don't understand I don't, that. Kudos to Ray Park for taking yet another thankless role, which uh, will only utilize his physical skills and not any of his horrible acting skills. He's a terrible. Well, but... apparently they originally were gonna have him speak, but then they thought that would be too against <laughs> canon. He looks like he's on his way to a rave. You know when your kid gets like a, one of those Superman costumes and it's got the muscles built into it <laughs> they look ripped. that's right. what he looked like. oh george michael blues like uh muscle suit it'd be hard if you were dating this guy and that was his like secret thing and he walked in and he was in this outfit <laughs> i would be into that uh you know your film sucks uh when you spend 175 million and can't make a cgi plane look believable flying across the desert 15 minute mark so the, uh, the joes picked these two guys up ripcord and duke because they're the only two that survived amazingly from this uh, first excursion they got the warheads back the joes have to take duke and ripcord to their secret location in the desert guys and Cress, what is wrong with this plane why does it have no windows? First of all, it's not Wonder Woman's fucking <laughs> invisible plane. And then why does it look like somebody literally was like, oh, shit, I don't know how to make this. Oh, check it out. My son's got this fucking knockoff toy in his uh, closet. I'm just going to, like, run a 360 camera around that. Oh, and my we'll God. Just throw that in there. Yep. It's it looks so like, terrible. It looks like knockoff Legos. I don't know how many of you have seen the old Jerry Anderson, Thunderbirds, Captain Skull, any of those. Imagine if they had taken the original toys of the plane (laughs) and just done that. I should have taken that plane and just thrown it in a toilet bowl. It's the same effect. They they didn't properly (laughs) shrink it down from like a distance wise, like from going away from the camera. They didn't properly shrink it down. Technically, G.I. Joe doesn't exist, uh, as does this impractically built underground facility. Uh, even when we played G.I. Joe, uh, even when we played with, I'm sorry, G.I. Joe action figures, uh, we knew shit like this would never exist at the 16-minute mark. And uh, we can recap this. Yes, there's an underground ocean we, uh, where they do training, which does come in handy later on. Uh, and if you're a fan you of Bio- see them doing above-water combat training and then below-water <laughs> combat <laughs> training. Underground. Yeah, somebody got stoned so and, like, played Sonic oh, the Hedgehog it's... way too much. Because well, that... <laughs> uh, they're going down in a CGI elevator. Well, they're on a, a stage, and there's a, there's a green screen around the stage, and then they simulate all this goofy shit that passes them by. Who's the contractor on this? Anybody who works for Dick Cheney. I live in Washington, D.C., and I've been <laughs> in certain facilities that are very secure, and they do have very, like, James Bond doors that come up and, like, retina scans and hand scans. Like, that's all real. None of them are in an ocean. But why do they always have the elevators that have no walls? And you're just (laughs) standing on a platform. That's so dangerous. (laughs) And I love it. And we're talking, as fast as we're talking and trying to get through it, guys, the scenes are going by even faster. Like, there's no time to absorb anything that's happening on screen because they're just moving from plot point to plot point so fast. And even at two hours, there's a lot. They do this for, I don't know, 25 minutes at a time. Oh. And then your eyes start to glaze over. <laughs> like, like, and then they put some prologue in, like right. flashback, flashback prologue in there. And then you are then you were like, wait, what happened? Right. And you had to rewind it. This is actually right when I started cleaning my apartment. This is it right here? <laughs> the <elevator laughs> this is the first time. Um, knowing is half the battle. Did anyone else throw up a little in their mouth uh, when Dennis Quaid shoehorned in this tagline? My God, guys, we actually had, I knew, I knew it was going to show up here, but I, you see the way Dennis Quaid just to, tried to throw it away. Like he didn't, he didn't even want to say it. That's I it. think he, yeah, I think he was like, this is the bottom. If this is want- where my career <laughs> bottoms out. Looks like McCallum's working an angle he don't want us to catch. Killer Croc. Adewale Akinewe Agbaji. 
has now shown up in two shitty comic book franchises and a shitty disaster porn film. Well done! 18 minute mark, folks. Can we please give this guy something better to do? Is he a talented actor? Has he done- I guess. He I does show up at big car accidents like that. Would you like to hear the opening two oh. lines of his IMDb profile? Born and raised in London, England, Adewale Akinwe Abaji began his career as a model in Milan. He graduated with a master's degree in law from London's prestigious King's College, which is very impressive, by the way, before moving to Los Angeles to make the transition to acting. This guy is insanely talented. <laughs> what is he doing? Uh, Please give him something better to do. He like... needs to do something like uh, Luther, like Idris Elba. Was he up for, was this guy, this Killer Croc guy, came, I'm sorry, I, and I apologize to the actual actor. I don't want to, I can know. I, 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 you don't want to, you don't want to have me do it. Um, how, was he? No, but I, I do, though. He, oh, yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> did he, Let's call him A. <laughs> Let's call him A, triple A. Uh, did he, you think he auditioned for the um, uh, Luke Cage role? I think he might have been good as that, though. Like, yeah, I think well, actually, that's, Luke Cage. that's a really he good have been good as Maybe Luke he, Cage. Yeah, yeah, he I, I, I like really the casting. Good. That's what I'm, I'm saying. Not no, I'm not mad at No, the guy they got's fine. I'm just saying. But I, for, but I he see needs where maybe, you're going with. Like, he I needs see. maybe a Netflix kind of series or, you know, like a Hulu kind of. Maybe he needs something where he, he does like a he, lip he, series. He's, he's often the best part of movies with horrible directors and scripts. I was just going to say, if you're going to give him a role in something else, like, it doesn't even have to be in, in English. He's fluent in English, Italian, Yoruba, and Swahili, among right. others. Really? So, yeah. Uh, oh, you kid! So he's even got more talent. No, he's Shut he's up. magical. Uh, I'm sending you now, Storm Shadow. Oh shit! Why is this Asian dude dressed like he just uh, got done filming a '90s boy band video? Uh, <laughs> Backstreet <laughs> Jones. No, he does look like he's out of a cage. Like that might be. What is that movie. outfit, guys? 19 minute mark. I don't it's remember Storm K-pop. Shadow. It's K-pop. I don't remember Storm Shadow looking that goofy. I don't like even that action figure. I'm just talking because like, he was always in the ninja outfit. He didn't wear anything else. Well, he looks. He, he was look- in the mask. He was in the mask with the goggles yeah, and the ninja got, outfit. He's got well, moose in his hair. He's got hair product for Christ's well, sake. Because this he's time a good he looking guy. Ninja outfit. And he's and he's one of the- Lee is an attractive South Korean man. He's one of the few actors that returned for the sequel. A lot of them did it. He actually. Oh, uh, I you know what? I, yeah, I noticed that, and also the including the director. American politics. I can't do the voice. Uh, the Mummy's Arnold Vosloo slums it up as the whistling action figure Zartan, mainly because Stephen Summers needed someone around to remind him he's done marginally better films. The 20 minute mark. Uh, they're on a plane sequence. Uh, McCallum's talking to uh, Storm Shadow and he's talking to uh, that Sienna Miller chick, Baroness, uh, or holograms. But uh, Arnold Vosloo's there. Man, talk about lazy. What a lazy acting job he did. He, ba- I, I think he did two days on this film, tops. Was the whistling from G.I. Joe? No, it was no. It was Artan didn't whistle like that. That's a, that's a, that's a whole. Okay, thing. so it's basically a rip off of Kill Bill, then, which yeah, is a rip off of GI Joe. So they're ripping each other off. It's <laughs> a circle jerk of rip off. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's hey. fun. Uh, now, folks, now you gotta remember that GI Joe went to their underground base. We talked about they had an ocean. Now we're in an actual ocean because uh, the, the villains, the Cobra Command, is going to their underground base and on he- Naboo. Who the hell? Yeah. <laughs> Who the hell were the contractors that had to build this elaborate undersea CGI base that looks like I said a leftover location from the old CQS DSV series? No, but, it's the uh, Gungans. We they took the Gungans left. I gotta go with Naboo on this, Paul, with the win on that one. Uh, come on, guys. Uh, you can't. Again, there's no way you can physically build all this shit. Who who do you hire to build that? We're gonna build a station. We gotta get into this right great. now. And it's I'm sure we build quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make the uh, Aquanauts pay for it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, the Lethal King Cobra. Uh, here we go, guys. Actor Joseph Gordon-Levitt shows up around the 21-minute mark, decked out in a horrible black wig and a steampunk Darth Vader mask uh, that makes him look like he's on his way to a cosplay convention in Duluth, Minnesota. Folks, if you're listening from Duluth, I apologize, but you guys have got some <laughs> shitty cosplay. <laughs> uh, I loved it. I thought he was great. <laughs> No, he can do no wrong. Terrible. Yes, he can do wrong, Sarah. It this was, film? It was, no, it was awful, but oh, awesome. So awful. No, he but, acted like he was in a cartoon. Yes, he did. And I'm okay with that. All right. By the way, spoilers. I didn't know it was him. Did everyone else know that it was him? Because I didn't. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. You can well, tell him. Oh, I was cleaning my apartment. I did and three it, loads of laundry and my apartment was <laughs> spotless because I guess like would pause it and be like, mm, I think I should go clean did, my bathroom. She did more for the world than this movie <laughs> than G.I. Joe did for the he world. So you should have known it was Joseph Gordon-Levitt because his tell, and I love him to death and I'm going to see Snowden and all this other stuff, is he, he acts with his forehead. 
He's always pointing his forehead at whoever he's talking about, no matter what movie he's doing. It's like the thing that he always does. Yeah, fo- yeah. folks, if you're wondering what we're tying this into, hey, you, you got Snowden comes out uh, tomorrow, and uh, you get to see Joseph. Just or, watch that forehead then, action. Watch the forehead in both films. But he, I thought he was spectacularly terrible in this. We'll talk a little bit more about him as he goes. But, but I, he, I'm going to disagree with you. I don't think what? he was terrible. I think he was the uh, only uh, one that was actually doing a G.I. Joe villain. Really? He was, the, uh, no, I, he was doing the weird walk, I and he think, was like, yeah, he okay. did that. Yeah. But I was that. committed. He yeah. was committed, he was and I loved it. Again, I, I wanted to look it up because I like Joseph Gordon-Levitt so much. I was like a little just like, oh, really? You yeah, did exactly. this? Yeah. Uh, but it turns out that he described his vocal performance as half reminiscent of the character from the 80s cartoon and half his own ideas because, and this is the kicker, he felt rendering it fully would sound ridiculous. <laughs> I did think that his character was exactly what the film deserved. He's actually the star of the film. Yes. Because the movie is G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra. Well, te- yes, and but he's one of the- Spoiler alert. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to say it because the, even the IMDb doesn't give you the spoiler alert of who the reveal he is you at the end of the film. You can figure that out long before the movie ends. But I'm just saying, he's the star. He's also the star who didn't bother to show up for the sequel either, by the way. Can you blame him? Can him? you blame him? The character came back, but not him. Uh, yeah, no, I can't. Uh, I'll be coming for- oh, wait. I'll be coming with you to retrieve the warheads as opposed to coming on you, uh, which might have made for a more interesting scene. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I really got to read my jokes before I spit them out of my mouth. 26 minute mark. I don't. Uh, I um, you watch the porn parody. I don't even know what I don't see that was. The one. Yeah, I was in a different movie. Sorry. Guys. I'm, no, I'm sure there is like a porn parody that's like the rise of the. the it's rise probably of the, the rise of my cobra. The, yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Sorry, Paul, I'll be here all week. Uh, say yes, you idiot. He's a real American hero. Uh, well, at least we get one pointless flashback scene where Joseph Gordon-Levitt doesn't look like a complete idiot at 27 minute mark. At least we get to see him without all that crap on him. He's the brother of the Sienna Miller character of Bar- who becomes Baroness. Baroness, the Sienna Miller was engaged to, this is the engagement scene to that stupid ass Duke. Uh, so they were going to get married and then uh, we'll talk about scenes coming up where she they made get... him promise to bring her brother home safe because I, they were going I, on a very dangerous top secret mission. And of course, she didn't. He didn't bring him home safe. And so then he just totally wimped out and didn't even go to the fucking funeral. My note for uh, this scene and the one just before it was first one was just yay clunky exposition, and then the next one was just boo cheesy flashback. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the clunky exposition that was a coming on you joke that I made, right? Was yes, it was. All right, all right, just want to make sure I got my cum straight. Oh, for Christ's sake. You don't want to get spelling out everywhere. Hey-oh. <laughs> that was also the most unromantic oh. uh, proposal ever. He didn't even ask her. Thank the words you. didn't come out Thank of his mouth. You. But it does mean I got to get your mission ready, Josel. Uh, cutie obligatory training montage where we're introduced to a budget of improbable weapons and a fight scene we, and fight scenes, I should say. Uh, God, we got to write my notes right. We could care less about 28 minute mark. Ripcord and Duke. In order to be to be accepted, we have to do a chunk of running time of all these bullshit fight scenes. Uh, and here we go. Uh, let's suit up. We're introduced to a Tony Stark Iron Man suit knockoff, which will only be used in one sequence later on, folks. Why aren't these suits used all of the time? Uh, this would have saved them a lot of hassle later on. I love when they have this tech stuff, and they only use it for one thing. But if they just used it all the time, they would wipe out the Cobra Command people easily, I, right? I believe they probably... Put in the throwaway line later, just like this stuff is expensive. Or the so prototype, or the prototype, <laughs> or yeah, I'm tired of seeing that in films. Yeah. Uh, gotta get it on. Hey, who thought a rap version of T Rex's uh, Bang a Gong was a good idea? It was so <laughs> bad. And oh. I've heard Carlos Santana and Gavin Rossdale perform that song. And Ooh. oh, I'm, da- I'm now I'm dating myself because it's a very old song, but still, that they should have used the original version if, or something else. Why would you use that shitty version? Something bro- else. God damn it. Because it was 2009. Uh, it. And here's one of my favorite parts. Uh, they Joes? As if one mummy actor slumming around wasn't uh, enough, Brendan Fraser rolls into his uh, his training montage sequence around the 30-minute mark wearing a snappy beret to hide his bald spot. I thought that was really nice. They never explain who he is. No, it d- d- uh, cares, Sarah. Well, why- can I just say something? They had another, the woman who's just following Dennis Quaid around with the electronic clipboard. She's terrible, too. Oh, by the way, she's cover girl. What, like Anna Kordakova. Mm-hmm. Carolina, Carolina Kordakova. And actually, I thought, for a, model, I, no, I, for a model, I thought she was not bad. 
No, I thought she was terrible in it. I, d- I disagree with you on that uh, completely. Uh, but, uh, not as bad as... I Freddy, said for a model. Not as bad as Brendan okay, Fraser. What Brendan was he doing Fraser that voice? was not credited in this movie, but he was Sergeant Stone, who's another key character. <laughs> Sergeant Gallstone? He was fucking terrible, dude. Uh, he played Sergeant Wink to the previous <laughs> franchise. <laughs> Warheads, Rip. Come on. Uh, why didn't the base alarm automatically sound when Cobra Command broke through the rock wall? Uh, you could fart and set off a car alarm, yet no one notices four <laughs> massive, <laughs> massive drillers breaking into the Joe compound. Come on, guys. Yeah, there's like, no cards. There's, there's no these four there. massive drillers are called moles, mole pods, or it's really some mole stupid. pods. They break through an entire rock wall into the base, the underground base we've been talking about. Nobody notices this. What's that thing? The medic alert thing? They don't have like one of those little things to push. Like shit, somebody just broke through. I push my medical alert button. I've fallen over my aquapod. I can't get it up. Then when she gets out of the fucking mole uh, thing, she holds up, you know, a scanner that somehow shows her the blueprints of the entire place. Yeah, like, oh, that. there's there's where the warheads are. Like, what the fuck is that? They're in a fucking that. safe underground. Bullshit. I call bullshit. Well, what what I call bullshit on is that <laughs> <laughs> when, when one of the, however many it was, like eight or nine, it, it seemed to be of those drillers go through the wall. There was wall. at least four. There was well, at least four. Because... One of them hit a guard who then goes flying. <laughs> Right. Wouldn't he just be impaled by the drill? Oh, he would have been ripped yeah, apart. He, yeah, he would have been shredded. They're going to get the warhead, which is trapped in the underground base below the uh, water training facility we mentioned about four hours ago. Uh, hello, brother. Jesus, do we need yet another uh, flashback for characters we don't care about? There you go, uh, uh, Griff. Can't Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow just uh, be ninjas who fight cool at the 38 minute mark? Why did they? we have to have a whole backstory, an entire backstory around these two guys, one of whom doesn't even talk, He's in fucking uh, scuba suit for the entire film. The other one looks like a 90s, uh, was it, K-pop you guys mentioned? Nobody ever said, when I was playing with G.I. Joes, or if I was when I was a kid, I never thought, hey, these two <laughs> okay. guys, yeah, and, and they were kissing each other. I never thought maybe these two guys should have a backstory. Okay. Uh, <laughs> they could have uh, cut the whole thing out, and I, it would have right. been yes, It would have been better. Um, go, 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 CGI gadget copter at the 40-minute mark. Maybe <laughs> the single worst CGI vehicle in the entire film. Boy, that thing sucked, guys. Um, t- uh, that's the one where Storm Shadow opens up a, car- a crate that apparently he knows exactly what's inside and then gets his go-go gadget copter on and then flies around CGI. His little, his little uh, jet pack. The CGI is really bad. Like, really, really bad. bad. Like, like insultingly bad. Even Cress's kids are like, this sucks. Uh, and they're pretty easy. I literally started developing a migraine. So that leads film. me to my next it's logical so question, guys. Who is the target audience for this film? Is it kids or is it adults? It was people uh, in my generation who were fans of the original G.I. Joe well, who adults. were, like, stoked yeah. for it. And then we could bring our kids to it. Like, look, this is what I loved as a kid. And then we walked out of the theater like, I'm so sorry. That had nothing to do with what I loved <laughs> uh, as a kid. Yeah, it's people are, like of our generation who are just, like, hoping it would be good. Uh, see ya, Duke. Uh, these Joes really suck at their job if they can't hold on to one suitcase full of warheads in their own facility. They actually lose the case, in case you're wondering, folks. After all this running around, so, so a bunch of people who have never been in, in this facility break in and within, what, five minutes steal the thing they're trying to hold on. Like, they're really shitty at uh, their job, right? And also what was shitty was the entire fight scene. Like, it's I was not only not caring about it, but also I just wrote down, someone needs to learn how to hold a camera properly because it was so fucking shaky. I couldn't really get couldn't see what was going on most of the time. Any threats, demands? Veteran actor Jonathan Price uh, joins the ongoing list of once talented thespians who fill out the back end of their career with mortgage payment rolls. 41 minute mark. Uh, oh my God, it was G.I. High Sparrow. Why was he even in this? It was it like, was he a fan of G.I. Joe and he had no, uh, like Dennis Quaid, I guess, or uh, whoever else? <laughs> yeah, nice. He <laughs> was worried about the pirate <laughs> checks that weren't coming in anymore. I know. Uh, it was for the Game of Thrones check. So he plays the president, folks, and he ends up getting into the bunker. There's a reason why he's in this film and why the president's here, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we go. Uh, but it's a, it's a one-day shoot for Mr. Price. Thank God. Uh, you get knocked down, you get back up. Uh, thanks to Marlon Wayans uh, for that fortune cookie pep talk to Rachel Nichols around the 42-minute mark. Uh, we can apply this message to watching crappy films as well. Cheap joke there, but it's very true. Um <laughs> Yeah, they lose the battle, of course. They barely get injured, guys. They have like the they have the cosmetic scratches, the sexy ones. 
They don't have actual, like, really injuries. Like, Rachel Nichols did, it doesn't have an eyeball hanging out of her head, which I thought would have been more realistic. But, no, she just have those, she has those cute scratches around But she's a super genius. Also, those scratches, by the way, disappear completely in the next scene she's in. So uh, they have awesome medical facilities at that underground facility with the— Well, I feel like a Channing Tatum scars changed in every scene. Oh, yeah, that's who. He didn't care. <laughs> Uh, Tokyo, 25 years earlier. Here we go, guys. Welcome to another time filler flashback as we uh. watch two young boys kick the shit out of each other uh, with all the intensity of a drug deal gone bad. 43 minute mark. Boy, this was brutal. Um, I thought it would have been great if the scene uh, was like a meat cute and they ended up kissing at the end of it. Oh, come on. Uh, no. This get- is where I clean my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this is where I went to go to the bed. Oh, you guys. You guys are crapping out the <laughs> best scene. <laughs> I had things to do. I didn't have time to press pause. You guys have one job when you come on the show. Is no, to watch the I, I pressed pause. Stuff. I watched it. I watched it. In the one fight scene where a kitchen gets destroyed, you went and cleaned your kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's two kids fighting. I didn't, like, come on. I know, but they're both actual martial artists. I no, mean, I'll give it up. The kids were, were, like, kicking ass. They actually like, kicked ass. I'm it was a... the best fight scene in the movie. The kids were really good. How would you know, Poland? You're cleaning your goddamn kitchen. You know, I hit pause. Right. I just, I hit pause. I watched the whole back. thing. Okay, that's what they all say. I really like the idea, actually, of getting rid of all of the flashbacks, but leaving in the shot that leads into it, so you just get the, <laughs> the strange look on their face and then just cut away. <laughs> they call him Destro. Uh, we now get the explanation of the Monty Python French scene at the top of this mess. Uh, I wonder if that metalhead will have anything to do with one of the characters at the end of the film. Maybe. Mm. I, know, so. mm, I wonder. Well, it actually doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely, it doesn't. Right, Mr. Hawkins with the win, and you'll find out very soon, folks, that he's absolutely correct. Very good, Paul. East Africa, four years earlier. <laughs> Woo! Everyone keeping up with these unnecessary backstories? Uh... Now, this is the one where Joseph Gordon-Levitt gets blowed up real good and turns into a steampunk Darth Vader. Pay attention, folks. 48-minute mark on that one. In case you want to know how he became steampunk Darth Vader, that's the scene you want to watch, folks. I'm not going to go through what it is. He gets to basically what I said. He goes into a building. Well, he was like Joe it's, Nice Guy, and then he was like... Well, I'm not, he wasn't a and nice guy. And then he went to, he like... Was, he really I'll, wasn't Joe Nice Guy, though. He was kind of a dick. Like, his sister's getting proposed to, and instead of being like, oh, sis, a I'm so happy for you. He's like, we got to go. Right. Like, fucking get this over with. He went from being kind of a dick to uh, Emperor Palpatine, like, ultimate power. <laughs> Also, possibly the worst organized airstrike in the history of <laughs> oh airstrikes. Oh, God, yes. Totally. Paris, France, uh, 825 hours. Uh, welcome to the longest action sequence in the film where we're going to take a big shit on the entire country of France. You're welcome. Uh, One minute, Mark. Here we go, guys. Uh, we gotta, we, uh, now, this I have to break down because what happens is they find out the warheads are headed to France and uh, that they're going to use one of these warheads as a demonstration in France. We're not going to tell you. But can I just say yet. something? How come we'll they didn't figure out from the get that it was the Eiffel Tower? Like, let's see. I just said, don't Somebody's going to fuck up France. <sighs> what are they going to do? Yeah, I don't know. I know. They're going to get rid of all the fucking baguettes. I genuinely did feel like I was jumping back in time and watching Team America again. Uh, yeah, I, just... well, here we go. <laughs> uh, I told you, I don't have much time. Uh, why does Sienna Miller's gun look like a small blow dryer? 52 minutes. Mark. Do you notice that, that little gun where she shoots the uh, pulse arrays? First of all, that's the greatest weapon in the entire film. Why don't the Joes have that weapon? I don't understand why Cobra Command has the pulse, ar- the pulse array weapon, which which really is a blue light that blows everybody back about 25 feet. Um, can I just say something? This is the same thing that was in the you know opening scene that like melted the yeah. Apache helicopters. Right. And now all of a sudden it's just like blowing people back. I could I use one of those in the club. With this weapon. In the club, yeah. You, yeah. You blow all the guys back. Yeah. Yeah. You you do what I say when I say it. Uh, why do the two least qualified guys get to tear up Paris in these Iron Man suit knockoffs or Iron Man knockoff suits? Uh, they barely know what's going on, much less have the ability to successfully operate this equipment. Fifty-five minute mark. Why do Ripcord and Duke get to wear these suits when they have a whole team of people trained to wear the suit? And why did they only have two suits? Budget. Uh, yeah. yeah <laughs> and this is where we get the number one worst CGI yep. sequence of all time. That was my next line, but I'm gonna. You can go into it, uh, Chris. I, the next line is physics be damned. 
No one will ever know. People in vehicles really can't float around the screen like they're not really there. When, is it, when Scarlett is on uh, this motorcycle, uh, 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 this has to be the that, worst. Go ahead. It's, My it's favorite part about it, though, isn't even the terrible CGI when she's going around cars and kind of through them. If you, like, watch it slow enough, there's, like, parts where the bike is melting into cars and then well, reappearing. I, but the best part is the close-ups of the actress Rachel Nichols, right. when she's clearly just like being towed on the back of something, and she's like, "Come on, guys!" This, You're is, like, this is where the budget must have ran out in this film, and this is the most important sequence. I know it's not that many years ago. I know it's only seven years, but the the technology that has come out in the last seven years for animators and CGI people is so tremendous. I mean, every give you that. probably every few months, some new breakthrough comes through. Because even if you just look at like the history of Pixar and you look at the first Toy Story versus Toy Story 3 in terms of the quality of the animation and how the characters look, it's complete. It's night and day. So uh, I'm yes, going to give a little, little bit of leeway bit. to the crappy animators, but also There's it was no like reason. they just fucking gave up. It looks like a Sharknado. Well, yeah. well, I don't know if it's quite oh, that level, but, but there's a lot of floatiness, and I, I really, there, there's no gravity applied to the effects. So no. it's, it's, it's like they're the bouncing off stuff. Off. At $175 million, there's no excuse for this film, which is a major release from, I think, what, Paramount or 27, whoever releases, that it should look this bad on a big screen. I know it was released in 3D. And maybe that accounts uh, for some of the wonkiness. I know Sarah's getting it. I am so glad we didn't watch this in no, 3D. No, we, don't, we, won't watch, we won't watch any of our films in 3D. Oh, so thank you. It's been if I'm in 3D. But see, once again, this is a movie that, for whatever reason, employs almost 20 different VFX studios. And the problem when you do that is, is you don't, it's too many cooks in the kitchen. So one guy has one way of doing something and the other company has a different way of doing something and none of them ended up looking good. The fact that when Marlon Wayne's character gets hit by that car, it didn't even attempt to slow down. Just, <laughs> he's standing <laughs> outside that Santa. vehicle. The driver's just going, oh, there's someone in a giant metal suit. Better and speed up. Let me, and let me, <laughs> and before we, I finish out the sequence, let me recap that. What the whole genesis of the scene is, they, there's a truck with the warheads that are on their way to the Eiffel Tower. These guys are following on foot in the Iron Man suits, basically. So there's two guys on foot, and then there's another uh, van that's following them that has Breaker and Scarlet and uh, the Killer Croc in it that are following them. And, and, and it's Scarlet gets on a motorcycle, and we talked about that bet really hard. Probably some of the worst CGI I've seen. First of all, cars, when they hit something, they don't go flying in the air. But Come this on. is how you knew it was filmed in America. There's too many SUVs. Yes. They're in a Hummer. Right. I'm like, I'm sorry, this is fucking France. France. They don't Nobody's have that. Nobody's driving a Humvee and all this no, other they shit. They, they don't have that. They all have, the only realistic scene was the scene that Paul was talking about where he gets hit by the fucking little tiny, you know, Fiat. Boom, plows into him. Where's all the rest of the little tiny cars that are in fucking France? Also, I'm fairly certain that car is pristine, actually, <laughs> once it's hit him. It's right? not a scratch on it. Uh, let's get that bastard off the roof uh, by turning your uh, SUV into a partial transformer. Sure, a 56-minute mark. That's where they put the, the big kettle prod. What's that? Kettle? I know. How did cattle that catcher. happen? Cow catcher. It's called a cow catcher. How would you be able to do that when you're in motion? Like, the car just right. sort of, like, can't. does, like, a bunny hop? No, and you then can't do it. Out. Also, that cow catcher, if you hit another car with that, it's not going to fly straight up in the air and behind you. It doesn't, no, it it doesn't forward, physics, just... guys. Right, you're just going to hit it. It doesn't. It, it'll do it for cows because it's a cow catcher. It's not going to do it for an entire car. Well, well that's why I feel thanks. like in this way the cartoons yes. were almost more realistic. Yeah, <laughs> because they went along with some laws of physics. Uh, this sequence, yes, this really perfectly illustrates what everything wrong with the movie, and then, like I said, how the cartoon was maybe more realistic. Why does Sienna Miller take the elevator? <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, okay. And then she's like, she kicks that lady out, and then she's like, nice shoes. Like, what the fuck? Uh, some place with a lot of dot, dot, dot metal. Uh, and of course, did anyone else not figure out the villains were going to go to bomb the Eiffel Tower before we gave it away in a spoiler alert early on? Thanks, Chris, for that. Uh, of course, they gave it away in the trailer. Can I just say, that's not Wasn't giving it sound. away. There's nothing else in fucking France to even attack. That's what I thought when I saw that. I was like, they're waiting this long to show <laughs> something that they revealed in the trailer? Are you kidding me? And here we go, folks. Congratulations, Duke. You just saved Paris. They do actually... Uh, no, they Eiffel Tower gets hit, but they managed to uh, shut off the nanobites from preventing the whole city from going up. Uh, this over... Here you go, guys. Now we can all throw up. This overbloated sequence, this sequence alone of destruction lasts nearly... Ready? ready? Anybody want to... Let's do a guess. Uh, how long? Uh, Paul, how do you think how long the sequence was? Go. 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, Sarah? I'll go 25 minutes. Griff? Uh, 12. And Crest? 525,600 <laughs> minutes. 
It's actually, guys, 15 minutes in length. Shut the front door. (laughs) Nearly 15 minutes in total length from the start of the prayer sequence to this end. This uh, movie has no editing. Now, my question is when I when I found that uh, and I'm watching, my question, and maybe uh, it's the old man in me, I was wondering how many civilians were injured in the scene? What was the total cost for all the property damage they left in their wake? And that's the good guys and bad guys. See, that's why they should have been arrested because they get my kids were watching the sequence and they're right. like, aren't those guys the good guys while they're getting arrested? I was like, because they just fucked up the whole <laughs> fucking city. <laughs> I said this film uh, makes Man of Steel look like Superman 2. You got to think about that one. But yes. yeah. Yeah. Uh, the French agreed to let you all go. Dennis Quaid's battle injuries had nothing to do with his legs. Yet he shows up in a wheelchair. Uh, Thank you. This, uh, send the team home speech at the hour and nine minute mark. I thought he just got cut across the chest, but maybe I missed And that. I don't know why he passed out in that scene. He was just well, cut. I, no, actually, my thing was, oh, now I know why he looks like he's in pain whenever he walks. Apparently, <laughs> he was, like, paralyzed or something. <laughs> uh, uh, I was like, oh, maybe he had polio, and they just... All cut of, out that those scene. injuries, and he never took that action figure out of his ass to make him walk better. Well, but mm-hmm. that's, I mean, that would make sense. I seriously wonder if they cut that out. Because I, he was walking like he was in pain. Yeah, but Channing Tatum got blown up twice <laughs> in this movie, no, and no, he was whatever. still walking fine. Dennis Quaid's character never walked all that well. No, I know he had that li- he had that stance. He's got that weird stance, but yeah. I- so I wonder if that was maybe an aspect of his character that was cut out. I think I figured out where all the money went and why they only have two super suits. This guy was siphoning money so that he could buy prosthetic stuff from the government so that he could walk again. <laughs> and when he was slashed, they happened to cut the connection. Uh, <laughs> yes, they hacked oh, it. All right, that's it, it. It adds up. Uh, more unnecessary flashbacks of the two kids beating the tar out of each other roll out around the hour and 10 minute mark, which makes for uh, another excellent pee break. Uh, there you go, Paul. Or blowjob if you're on the uh, Netflix and chill plan. Oh, yeah. Uh, this yeah, is yeah. when I uh, folded all my laundry. I did not. I, I did pee. I, I made my bed. I did not get a blowjob, uh, sadly. But uh, here we go. Uh, <laughs> I, actually, I actually did get up to pee during this. Yeah, see? I was, yeah, so I'm not that far off, guys. I wasn't really that. I'm like, all right. <laughs> if Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow would just uh, go at it all, broke back mountain. Uh, we'd have a much better film. All right, I guess I'm on my own one that way. Well, hey, look, I can have my own movie. It's it's I it's my my viewing. Uh, didn't anyone else pretend uh, their male action figures were fucking, or was that just me? Okay, great. I'm I got. That wasn't just. I, I already sunk myself in the previous line, and then I had to put the lid on it uh, with the following joke. Okay, uh, I guess I got some. I guess I got some stuff to think about after the show. It wasn't just you. <laughs> Is that weird? Is this the Lady of the Lake? Uh, was anyone else creeped out by uh, Dr. Destro kissing uh, Miller around the hour and 15 minute mark? Uh, well, can I just talk. say something? I got, yeah. I almost threw up at this point because <laughs> when you see when you see him go in for the kiss, he like like a snake unhinges his jaw <laughs> and you see his jaw just go like, you know, Sienna Miller was like deep throated like she's uh, never been uh, deep throated. Uh, she probably and then you look at her face after when they cut to her like looking fun. over at Duke. She's like, please help me. Uh, it was like disgusting. when two teenagers kiss, you yeah. know, and they, they don't know what they're doing yet. Let me just say, there's three really awkward kisses in this film. There's this kiss, there's the kiss between her and her husband, the Baron, where he gets, you know, shanked, and then the kiss between her and Duke later, so, where so it's all like, the kisses. <laughs> but let me just say, like, I just looked at that with Channing Tatum, and I was like, he's the worst kisser in the world. He totally did like the '90s. I'm Ew. just gonna. No, give the- all of the inside part of my lips all over your face. They're sitcom kisses. They're TGIF Friday kisses. <laughs> or TGI Fridays, if you happen to be there. Well, Sienna Miller, she was kissing oh, everybody. No, those are, she almost those kissed are... as many people as Lindsay Lohan and just oh, luck. Video from the Aqua Cam is coming online right now. Uh, you had me until the underwater camera fish. Uh, there was no action figure for that thing. Hour and 16 minute mark. The technology gets dumber and dumber. So they, they find out there's an underground, their underground sub base for Cobra Command is underneath the polar ice cap. So I should mention that because it's coming into play here. And the Joes find out where they're at because they have that funky, uh, really cool underwater camera fish. This scene has possibly the worst joke in the entire film in it. When he's saying like, you know, like finding a needle in a coal mine. And so someone uh, just says, uh, haystack. <laughs> and so he said, haystack in a coal mine. And then I wrote down, that joke was so obvious, I'm surprised it didn't come with a Looney Tunes sign saying, joke incoming. (laughs) 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 All right. Honestly, no, you know what? Now that he brings it up, I feel like there were a lot of, like, 
Looney Tunes hokey like references. There's, in this. Yeah, I guess yeah, I but guess those were the jokes weird. they did in GI Joe, though. I know. You have to adapt correctly. I think Summers, like I said, I think Summers was like really obsessed with the cartoon, oh, right? And he wanted to basically translate the cartoon as much as he could. Uh, who are you? If you think Joseph Gordon-Levitt couldn't get any worse than his turd, just wait until he takes off that ridiculous wig and steampunk Darth Vader mask around the hour and 21 minute mark. He looks like an action figure casualty from that little bastard sit in Toy Story. Like, He's like Freddy Krueger. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was like, I wrote down, I want to see his gross face. And then I got to see his gross face. <laughs> uh, all right. That's all I wanted. Oh, I know. At least the practical FX makeup people were better than oh, the 90, 90 minutes in heaven. <laughs> oh, oh, wouldn't that be great, though? That's if he took a low off- bar. Yeah, I it- know, right? So- a very low bar. Wouldn't that be great if he took off that breather and he had a porn stash? I would have loved that. <laughs> or, or just just a child one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All burnt uh, up on his face. That would have been. This could have used a good mustache. I could fly anything. Ripcord could barely operate the Iron Man knockoff suit. Yeah, we're supposed to believe uh, he's able to pilot a prototype aircraft uh, he's never seen before, guys? Sure, hour and 25 minute mark. So what happens? They find out where the base is. They get to the base, but they're at the top part of the base. And they build, it's a, it's called a Nightbird or a Firebird or a Nighthawk. I don't know what the hell that play. It's the one that Clint Eastwood drove. Night before. Raven, I think it was. Yeah, the one that's yes, same. Night Raven. I know, I'm sorry. I'm just thinking of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, like the Nightman. <laughs> the Nightman. Nightman. Oh. <laughs> and does anyone else notice like when she says, like, they actually built one? It's like, how do you know what it is then? Right. If, you, if you've never seen it before. Yeah. What the fuck is this thing? So anyway. Well, earlier when they find out where the location of the pit is, he's like, I've only heard whispers of the pit. You know, like, what? <laughs> So there's a shitty CGI plane there that uh, Wayne's is going to figure out. Wayne's character should have been called Rip Shit because that's our reaction to this mess. Wow. Another cheap joke. You know, I was getting desperate near the end of my notes uh, just because I was waiting for the movie to be over. Uh, what was the end? So, uh, ooh. But I'm bummed. <laughs> Hawkins with, with, the, uh, with the begrudging win on that one. But all right. Uh, science requires sacrifice. So does acting. And boy, did Levitt sacrifice for this film. Ha <laughs> ha. His dignity for one. Uh, uh, and you guys say you're going to give him a pass on this one. I, I'm going to hold him accountable, but okay. Yeah. Why? He was actually entertaining. Well, all right. Yeah, yeah. He committed. He committed. I know. He did. He did. Yeah, I have to say he probably was 100% to be fair. Uh, but what are you going to. I think Channing Tatum was like, what the fuck did I get myself into yeah. most of the time? Joseph Gordon Levitt was on a, on a certain trajectory. He is probably still going to be okay. Channing Tatum was probably terrified that this was going to fucking end his career. Uh, deploy the sharks. Well, I guess having an underground water training facility really worked out for the Joes, huh, guys? Our 27-minute mark, because now we have to have an underwater battle. First of all, isn't, I'm now being t- I know I'm being all like Adam Savage on this, but isn't being underwater a lot like being in space? So why is everything so goddamn loud? I would love to hear an accurate <laughs> film, like what one of those, just say, so like you see the missile go off and you just hear, <clears throat> <laughs> giant explosion uh, now you die Jesus I hope someone gets killed uh, to end this decades long ninja action figure fight at the hour and 34 minute mark I was so tired of seeing these two idiots go at it uh, one does die but he really doesn't die so we're cheated on that cause... it turned into Mortal Kombat I mean, as in like the that movie that would have been fantastic if every time they were fighting just dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> all right second one of my sights how the hell was he able to travel from Moscow to Washington, D.C. in less than 18 minutes, guys? That plane doesn't have warp capabilities, dot, 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 or does it? Uh, well, even the bombs weren't traveling well, that fast. So let me say, let me recap real quick. They, the, the villains set off three nuclear bombs with the warheads, nu, nu, three missiles with the with nanomite warheads on the top of them. They blow up one of them. One is heading to Moscow. The other's heading to Washington, D.C. Ripcord is in that Night Raven shit we mentioned, that Clint Eastwood Fox crap. He's got to go after and stop it. So he first is able to stop the one that goes to Moscow. And, like, and then he has to turn the plane around from Moscow and then warp back all the way to Washington, D.C. I don't think you could make it in 18 minutes. Am I wrong would, on this? Would you like to hear the difference in speed between Mark V and Mark VI, which are the speeds they can go? Okay, go ahead. So Mark V is 3,836 miles an hour. Earth. Mark VI is 4,603. <laughs> so he had to get from Moscow to Washington in, I believe, let's see, he blew up the one thing over Moscow, which was seven minutes away when you saw it on the screen, and it was 18 minutes away from the other one. So he had to blow it up over there, 
and then get from there to Washington in 11 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you would have made it. No. Yeah, exactly, guys. Come on, logic, guys. Simple logic. Ugh. Uh, he's taking the nanomites back to the upper atmosphere. These nanomites dissolve the Eiffel Tower and various other vehicles around it within seconds, yet now it takes a hell of a lot longer to dissolve Ripcord's plane, uh, only because the plot requires it to. Hour and 39 minute mark. I had to say, just going back to it a little bit, like all of the explosions and water when they were trying to get out of the base, it gonna... made me feel like I was on the backlot tour at Disney World. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There was no sound buffer on it. Like you said, it just would have been a poof, you know, like a, like a fart underwater. You would have never heard it. But here, everything is blowing up. You can hear the engines roaring by the, of the vehicles because there's. A, we should mention. I'm real quick. There's this big, massive underwater battle with the with the good guys and the bad guys, and they have all these little. It was like an X-ray. It was like if you saw Star Wars, the Death Star sequence. It's the same thing, but essentially. But but you, all the sound is intact, just like in Star Wars. All right, we can forgive it there. It's a little hard to forgive it when it's underwater. I don't know why, but it, it, I just call bullshit on that. But all right. But the uh, sound effects in the whole movie were bullshit. I mean, yeah, it was like I mean, every we, metallic sound they could possibly find in the thing. Let's use that over here. I mean, it was yeah. terrible. Here comes the big reveal, folks. You will call me Commander. Chelsea Le- Gordon Levitt trades in one ridiculous mask for another around the hour and 45 uh, mark, thus ensuring you won't have to appear in the sequel since the uh, new mask covers in- his entire face a la Darth Vader. Phew. Uh, so as it turns out, folks, he turns out to be Cobra Commander. Not the same mask as in the cartoon. I like the one in the cartoon better. Apparently, they didn't want to do the original mask because it was just a little too reminiscent of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, well, uh... well who's the problem with that? Uh, you know, Duke, this has just begun. Not for Levitt, Eccleston, Nichols, Killer Croc, and Dennis Quaid, who all refused to appear in the sequel a few years later. Uh, there might have been a few other actors in that mix, too. But once in the director, we should mention the director never even bothered to came back. Thank, uh, and the final note is, thank you all so much. Well, at least uh, Arnold Vosloo and Jonathan Price will return. They will return to collect another mortgage payment check at the hour and 49 minute mark. President turns, uh, High Sparrow. Yeah, it turns out, in case you're wondering why Jonathan Price would play the president, is because Zartan... Uh, he's a master of disguise. I didn't mention that earlier because nobody gives a <laughs> shit. And he, he disguises himself as the president, and so he is actually playing the president. He, in a he doesn't really disguise himself, though. They use nano mice right, to right. change yeah. his face. Hey, yeah. Paul, really, Paul, you're, gonna, you're really going to go there? Okay. Yes, okay. yes, I am. Let me tell you, this was a very long two hours. This, If this was 90 minutes, we could this would have been amazing. Uh, at two hours, it's a real drudge. I have nothing left. Yeah, you got nothing left. You're it's, a, it's, it's exhausting. So, this, nobody else cobra and like nothing. <laughs> I didn't even get one of those. Like, you know, or we didn't even get a real yo Joe. No, know? That, we just had that one yeah. killer croc guy did a half ass one. Yeah. Sauce. I know. I know. Sauce, yo Joe. I mean, it's like oh, if you're going to do G.I. Joe, we've been right. saying it the whole episode. It's like do the camp. Right. Just camp it up. Do the fucking cartoon because the cartoon movie was badass. I don't know. I used to have that on a. It VHS would no. The cartoon tape, movie was I, amazing. I yeah, that's good. The cartoon movie was great. Had a great plot. Had interesting, you know, characters, and even the action sequences were better than this movie. And that's what's disappointing is I thought that's what I was going to see in the theater, and once again I was just re disappointed all over again. All right, there you go, folks. That is a uh, wow. That is a uh, GI Joe: The Rise of Cobra. And we took it out and played with it a lot longer than we should have. This was a brutal one to go do. Can we flush it, ladies and gentlemen? Can we please, please flush it? Clan McCullen says flush it. <laughs> <laughs> consider it, consider it flush. There you go, folks. <laughs> 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 uh, that is it for this week as we get all nerdy in our 80s, uh, 80s cartoons. I want to thank uh, my lovely co-cinematic flushes, Midwest Movie Mogul, Clean Griffin, and Raging Wood Movie Queen Norcrest. Thank you, job. Great job as always, ladies. Thank our uh, great extended co-flushers tonight. Lovely content creator, Sarah Poulton. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for having me on. And next time, oh, God. Yeah, if you don't even know where to go with it. Yeah, we'll I talk, we'll talk later. Like, my brain hurts. hurts. I know, I know. So it's not going to get better. Paul's going to thank one half of the Apollo Clusters podcast, Paul G.I. Hawk Hawkins. You made it, sir. Yes, I, I did. I, I, <laughs> I, will, I will admit it is not as bad as Adam Sandler. There you go, folks. Uh, we'll be back to torture you with something else next week, which I guarantee is going to be shorter. Uh, say goodbye, ladies and gentlemen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Hey, this is Honor Knight, and I want to thank you for listening this week and every week as we flush these turds down our cinematic bowl here in the restroom. If you haven't already, please subscribe to us on iTunes and Google Play Music so you don't miss a single episode. You can also follow us on Twitter and use the hashtag Potter and Family, like us on Facebook, circle us up on Google+, and check out all of our episodes at our home restroom on the net, signalfury.com. Until next time, remember, we're here to flush it so you don't have to see it. 
I am Honor Knight, and this has been the award-winning Soiled Restroom Cinema.